Have you ever wondered why we recycle the same problems in the church year after year? Broken relationships, unresolved conflicts, inability to speak truth, false peace because we're concerned about being nice. Week after week, we hear sermons about loving better, but nothing changes. It has been rightly said that 85% of Christians are stuck, stagnant in their spiritual lives. Pete and I were among that number, and he was the lead pastor. We realized not only was the church's discipleship shallow, so was ours. Over the last 21 years, we have developed the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course to address this massive need. This eight session video curriculum will teach you practical skills that will radically transform your life. You'll look at things like your family history, going back three to four generations and how it impacts who you are today. You'll also learn things like how to resolve conflicts in a mature way. Thousands of people all over the world have gone through this course. It is changing lives and entire churches. This course will revolutionize the way you relate to God and the way you relate to people. Join us for a discipleship that actually changes lives. Hey, Willamette. We're going to do something fun this year with our summer message series. Uh, remember when you were in school and in the summertime your teacher would pass out like a sheet of paper with a bunch of um, uh, names of books on it and you could do a summer reading list? And some of you jumped on it right then. You went out, got the books, went to the library, started checking them off so that at the end of the summer you could turn them in and be a good student, maybe even win a prize. We tried it with our kids several times, and sometimes it works and sometimes it didn't because some of you, by nature, when your teacher handed out that list, would never give it another thought. And we've probably got all kinds here in our church, but I thought this summer we could do a summer reading list. I've picked six books that are not long, not hard to read, that have had a pretty big impact on my spiritual journey at different times and places. Some of them are old. One of them is over 300 years old that every Christian should read. One of them is brand new, but the themes and the topics are so eternal. We're going to encourage you. There's a, a wonderful list of books we're going to be going through. One of them is Henry Nouwen's book, In the Name of Jesus. Then we're going to run back real quickly for one week to a book we read at the beginning of 2020 that we never got to delve into enough, Surprise the World by Michael Frost. And then a book that changed my life in college and several times after that called The Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards. You're going to really appreciate that one. And then you know that we give to a, a group called Convoy of Hope. This is the, the founder of that group and his philosophy and insight and some of his backstory You'll need to read this too. They're providing 100 copies for us so you can get one of these free while the supplies last. And then I mentioned a 300-year-old book originally written in French now has come out in a modern English version. I highly recommend this one as I do all of them uh, by uh, Brother Lawrence, Practice of the Presence of God. And then lastly, we'll finish out the summer with a, a new author, a local author from the Northwest here, John Mark Comer, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. We've talked about that, but we need to keep coming back to that. So what you can do is you can pick up the Summer Reading List bookmark, and it'll be available to you at the, uh, at the uh, Connect Center and out throughout the church. It'll have all the listings and even the QR codes where you can go and order it right on Amazon. Different versions are available. Audio is available for some who would like to do that in your car. But uh, let's jump in. Let's make an investment this summer. For some reason, I read more in the summer than I do. Maybe it's because of more off time or summer vacation. But it's an opportune time for you to maybe push a few other things aside and draw some things that you wouldn't normally do, books you may not normally read, and to draw nearer to the king this summer. It is the call that's on all of our hearts. And so I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Hey, the uh, summer reading book list is out. Get yours today.
What's going on, Willamette family? We want to say welcome to you. It's glad to see everyone here uh, on Eugene campus, also in Junction City campus and online campus. We just want to say welcome. Well, today is Go Focus Sunday. That's a global outreach, and we have a bunch of outreaches, two in particular, that are, are happening today. Uh, one is RFK. Where's my RFK family at? Yeah. A lot of people are going out for that. Also, we have Joey Kelly from the Chi Alpha team uh, from our campus ministry going out to, uh, going to be speaking the message today. But before we do, we want to uh, let you know about a couple things that's going on here. So if you haven't seen this as you walked in, you should have gotten a um, uh, bookmark for our summer reading list. Uh, please, we've specially curated this list. We're going to do a sermon series starting next week uh, on, on these books. And so um, they're awesome books and they help you out and to help us all grow in our discipleship. There's also Surprise the World and your next 24 hours uh, free gifts for you. Limited supply, uh, both here and on Junction City campus. So um, avail yourself of those. Speaking of Junction City campus, our Emotionally Healthy Relationship Pilot Course is full in Eugene, but on Junction City campus, as of about Thursday, there are 10 slots. So if you're um, wanting to, to jump into that Emotionally Healthy uh, Relationship course, pilot course, Junction City, Thursday nights, um, there's only 10 slots left. So sign up on the check-in card um, or on the website for that. Um, but in Eugene, not this Monday, not tomorrow, because tomorrow's the fourth, but next Monday we'll be having our second uh, Monday prayer gathering, which happens every second Monday. Um, out in the lobby, 6.30 to 7.30, the prayer service. And it's been just a wonderful time of, of prayer and worship. We pray over the prayer request um, for the city, uh, prayer request for our local fellowship. So please come. 6 o'clock, the sanctuary opens if you want to uh, do some uh, private prayer um, over the prayer guide and things like that. And then 7.30, we start out in the lobby. It's been great. So uh, one thing I do want to shout out is our wonderful people on our tech team who are only noticed usually when they do something wrong or when something doesn't go right. So we want to we want to shout them out. Uh, we got cameras, we got lights, we got everything that goes on the screen. A person is there doing that um, serving. So uh, we want to just highlight them. But also, if you're interested in uh, joining the tech team, uh, we will train you. If you have an interest in what goes on behind the scenes, from lyrics that go up on the wall to uh, the broadcast to, um, to lights to, to cameras, we will train you if you're interested at all in any of that. Mark that check-in card. And speaking of, if you don't know where the check-in card is, if you look in the pocket seat in front of you, there's a check-in card there. You can also find it online. Uh, for our online campus in Junction City, you should have check-in cards there. But that is a, a, a great tool for you to let us know, uh, first of all, that you are here. And um, how can we be praying for you? Our staff prays each and every day, Monday through Thursday at 9 o'clock, over those prayer requests. So if you get a prayer request, uh, if you have a prayer request and send it in on Tuesday, we're going to pray over that. If you have a prayer request, you send it in anytime during the week. The staff will be praying over those. So I just want to encourage you all to um, give us the opportunity to pray with you. It's such a privilege for the staff here to pray and to partner with you. And also uh, put prayer, uh, praise reports on that because we do like rejoicing when God does answer prayer. It builds our faith. It builds your faith. And so let's do that. And so like we said, today is July 4th weekend. And so we wanted to celebrate that with our own Michael and Katrina Thompson doing a lovely rendition of America the Beautiful.
So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. All right, good morning. How's everyone doing? We good? Let's stand up. Let's worship. We are so excited to worship together. We've had Adonai over here. You may have seen him in the band. He's been interning with Oscar. And we're so happy to just have jo friends join us and worship with us. He's going to be with us the rest of the month. And then Ella, we're going to be sending off to RFK with the rest of the team. Blessings to you guys. Yes, so happy to worship with everyone. Let's sing. Let's give God all the praise. Sing praise. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, Jesus, name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the Every nation, every 
Show us to be more like you, Lord. We love you.
Yeah. Uh-huh. 
thank you. You are so worthy. You are so awesome. You are so wonderful. God, I ask right now that you would just touch everyone's heart that is going out and serving. Whether it's taking a bracelet today afterwards to pray for an RFK person or the people who are there and serving these kids. Would you give them the words to say to help these kids know that they can have a firm foundation and walk through. They can trust you in any circumstance that they may find themselves in. Lord, we ask that you would speak through and work through all of these volunteers, Lord. And give us, the church body, the words to pray, what we need to pray to speak out, to support them. You have called us to serve you and serve others, and that is what we are going to do. We love you. We give you all the praise because you are worthy. We love you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be here together. I want to invite you to say hello to people around you. Say hello to some of our RFK friends that are visiting today as well. Introduce yourselves. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Good morning, Willamette family. Good morning. Um, I figure probably it's helpful to do a, a reintroduction. I know I got to share about a year ago here, but um, I'm not Pastor Van, so he's a, a few grades older than me. Um, my name is Joey Kelly. Um, my family and I, we're actually, this Saturday is like our one year Eugene anniversary. Uh, so we've we moved here about a year ago from uh, Bellingham, Washington, and uh, we work with, uh, well, I like to also call ourselves like your friendly neighborhood missionaries, you know, just down the road at the University of Oregon, working with Chi Alpha, um, and uh, we've, we've loved it. It's been a wonderful year. I work with some amazing people. Um, we say that, like, often it's more important who you go with than where you go, and the people that we've come here with are amazing, and the students we've got to work with this year are awesome. I'm sad that they're like not here, because they all go home, but I um, look forward to seeing them again in the fall. Um, yeah, my wife's name is Daviel. I, we have two kids, Chloe and Marcus, and another one coming in December. So that about sums up life at home right there. They fight over mom and not me all the time, and so it's usually baby bump plus two kids on her lap all the time. And uh, yeah, so we're happy to be here. We're enjoying Eugene. The roads confuse us often, but the food is good. We love our home. And we're grateful for you. We're grateful for Willamette Christian Center. The pastoral staff has been gracious to us and supporting us. Um, you guys have like supported us just in welcoming us so often. Supporting us like, uh, I just think about the, um, the missions luncheon, earlier this year and the way that you came out and supported us financially too. Limit, we're just so grateful for you. It really like, our partnership with the church, like you may not see many students or come, you might not be on campus with us, but you play a huge role in what we do. And so thank you so much for being there with us. Um, yeah, happy 4th of July weekend. When Pastor Van uh, reached out to me and asked if I wanted to speak, I said, well, what do, you, what do you want me to speak on? And he said, well, we're actually in between series, so you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and I don't know about you. For some of you, that might be really exciting. But I get nervous, you know, when you play those, like, get-to-know-you games, and you say, like, what's your favorite food? Or if you could go anywhere, I'm like, I need, like, some weeks to think about this and plan and strategize, you know? Like, and, uh, and so he told me there was a little bit of, like, 
anxiety producing of like, how am I going to choose what to talk about? I also realized when he asked me too, whatever I say, if I say something wrong, he can just be like, well, I didn't tell him to say that. And so now all the blame is on me for whatever I say this morning. So I see that's like a veteran move on Pastor Van's part. So I see you. If you're watching this, Pastor Van, I know you did. So what are we going to talk about on this 4th of July weekend? And I did. I took a few weeks to kind of think through, man, Jesus, what, does, what do you want to say to our community this morning? And it's this. Jesus gave us in his final words, some of his final words, the Great Commission. And he said to all of us, those of us that follow Jesus, he said, hey, if you follow me, then you need to go make followers. Go and make disciples of all nations. And Jesus' Great Commission to us, that hasn't changed for 2,000 years. That still applies to us. I love talking about with students and saying like, hey, do you think this still applies to us? And you take a second and you're like, well, if they told those disciples to make disciples, and then those disciples were to make disciples, you can trace our lineage back to Jesus' statement a thousand years. So yes, that part remains true. But the part that has shifted throughout 2,000 years is culture. How do we make disciples can sometimes look different. And honestly, I've not been around this earth for too long. Even just in the fifth, past 15 to 20 years, it's felt like culture has shifted a lot. And so the question that I've been wrestling with, especially as I think about the college campus and I think about the next generation that's coming up, is how do I make disciples in this generation, in this time period? Or even, how do I make disciples in an increasingly secular world? And at least, becoming a, a less and less religious world, a less and less open to Christian world. How do I make disciples in an increasingly secular world? How do missions work? How do I love my neighbor, my coworker, my family, my classmate, who's disinterested about anything remotely religious and maybe at times has a negative view of religion or Christianity. How do we do missions now? There was a time not too long ago, we, I think we have a slide for this, where many of our churches looked like the ones on the left. Do we have that slide? Maybe. Full, there we go. Full churches, right? Like communities all over the place. Like you could just kind of say, hey, do you want to come to church? And not everybody said yes, but there was at least an openness to it. And fast forward just now, we see churches with a handful of people. I've gotten, in, just in this past year, I've gotten to visit churches throughout the state of Oregon. And what used to be, you could see how many churches per seat. Now you're seeing like there's, how, or not how many churches, how many people per seat. You're seeing like there is a row per person. And obviously COVID has some things to say about this. But in my own mind, as I think about this, like I'm actually convinced that COVID only sped something up. That was beginning to. I was a business major, so I love some good charts and statistics. So you're going to have to humor me for a moment. Barna did, this is in 2020, did a state of the church. And if you look at, look at like starting about 2009, the number of practicing Christians was about 50%. And then the other two graphs are just tracking with non-practicing Christians. So many people that just were like, hey, my family's Christian. So yeah, if you ask me, I'm a Christian. Or I grew up maybe in a, in a town or a community that's predominantly Christian. Yeah, I'm Christian. And then people not Christian. And then you look at 2020 and the graph flips. Half, 25% of practicing Christians. And this is like at the beginning of COVID. 
So there was something already happening in our Western world, in our culture. This was starting before the pandemic. There's even some estimates that say a quarter of churchgoers pre-pandemic have yet to return. And I'm convinced that we shouldn't hold our breath that that quarter is all going to return. And it's not just that people are going to church less. The number of people who have no religious affiliation whatsoever has been steadily increasing over the past number of years. This may not be too surprising to us because the largest number of religious nuns, as they've called them, not nuns, but religious nuns, the people with no religious affiliation, the largest group of those individuals are in our own backyard. On the next slide, 42% of people that live in the Portland metro area would mark as they have no religious affiliation whatsoever. That's 10% more than the next city in Seattle. That's just two hours from us. And this is in 2015. I've come to call Eugene kind of the Portland South. We already got the voodoo donuts. We got our salt and straw ice cream. Culture feels similar at times. It's probably not that much of a surprise to us to see the ways in which culture is, has shifted just in the past 10 to 15 years. The way that religion and Christianity has been viewed has been shifting. And of course, working on a secular campus and watching these statistics, you can understand why I've been thinking about this reality. How do we make disciples in an increasingly secular world? How do we do missions now? As I said, you probably noticed the shifts in your workplaces or families or in the news. And I don't know, for some of you, maybe this is like, I'm not trying to sound doom and gloom, but maybe for some of you, like, you know a time in which it was so different. And you, this is like frustrating. Or you feel anxious about the direction we're going. Longing for a culture that once was. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I just haven't been on earth long enough to long for a culture that once was, but I actually have a, a little bit of a different response. I actually have some growing optimism that I think we're on the verge of a helpful reset in how we think about making disciples, doing mission, and living out our lives as the church. We're getting closer and closer to a time where it's going to be harder and harder to just be culturally Christian. Or to be Christian because your family is. People are going to have to choose. Am I in to this following Jesus thing, which actually becomes less trendy than maybe it used to be? Or less okay? So people are going to have to realize that i got to be all in if I'm really in. And I think the more that we're in, the more Jesus transforms us. Amen? I'm also hopeful because Jesus knew that when he said, go make disciples, that culture is going to change. He knew that when he said that 2,000 years ago, in that specific cultural context, that it, that would still apply to us here in 2022. He knew that the strategies might change with culture, but the mission won't. And so praise the Lord, he sent us his spirit to fill our lives, to transform us, give us the things we need to live missionally. I also like it when he says, go make disciples, and at the very end of it, he says, and don't worry, I'm going to be with you. I all breathe a sigh of relief. Whew. I'm also grateful that he gave us many examples of people doing missions in different cultural contexts in the Bible. And so I want us to turn into our, into our Bibles to Acts chapter 9. So I think there's a helpful story that's actually going to give us some helpful context of what it looks like to do missions, to make disciples in our context now. 
And there's going to be like so much that we could probably never get to, but I think this will give us a good start. So we're going to find ourselves in the book of Acts, chapter 9, and there's going to be just two lessons that we're going to pull out of here to help us get started. But what does it look like to make disciples, to do missions now in an increasingly secular world? So we pick up partway through chapter 8, starting in verse 26, and I'm just going to read this for us. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candy, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over, and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah, and Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. And the passage of scripture he'd been reading was this. It's from the book of Isaiah. And it says, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? And the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And so, beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And if you keep reading on, our Ethiopian friend gets baptized by Philip, and then not to sidetrack us too much, but then there's this like subtle fun moment that you'll have to study on your own where Philip gets transported. So there you go, just make a little note and say, I gotta go study this later. What do I do with that in scripture? That's a sermon for another way, another day. So, what's happening here? So, the, the book of Acts takes place right after the four Gospels, which just uh, track Jesus' life. And they take place right after Jesus dies, gets resurrected, and leaves earth. And in fact, the very first chapter of Acts has this tiny little moment of Jesus. It's just like passing the baton moment. And it's basically the Great Commission restated. He says to his followers, Go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that little phrase is kind of like what sets up the entire book of Acts. You see it start tracking from like the good news of Jesus going from in Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then the ends of the earth. So this little little Jesus, Jesus movement is like catching steam in the first century. And so where we find ourselves is Philip has just spent time in Samaria and we're beginning to transition into that last section of the good news of Jesus going to the ends of the earth. And to Philip and other first century authors and audiences, Ethiopia, which would be modern day Sudan, actually represented in their minds as the ends of the earth. So if you were reading this as a first first century Jewish person, you would be like, here it is. The gospel is going to the ends of the earth. And it's really fun that some historians even point to this as like the introduction of the Jesus story of the gospel reaching the continent of Africa, which is so fun to think about. Here we are at the like precipice of this moment, truly reaching different ends of the earth. And so after spending time in Samaria, Philip gets told by an angel of the Lord to go to this desert road. Doesn't tell him to go to a city, just some dusty highway. And he runs into this Ethiopian in a carriage. And what do we know about this Ethiopian character? We know he's a foreigner on his way back from Jerusalem to worship. And then he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. And he's traveled a long way there. So he's at some level pretty committed to this sort of this Jewish faith that he would travel this far to go worship in Jerusalem. 
But since he wasn't Jewish, there would be some different ramifications for him. He'd probably be known as a God-fearer. And he hasn't, he, hasn't heard, he hasn't heard about this Jesus person and how this Jesus person, like, transforms the way that you read the Torah and the Old Testament and the prophets. We can also tell that he's a person of high status. He's got a fancy carriage. He's a treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. And in fact, the, the reality that he owns his own scroll says something too. Says that he has money, that he's a person of status, and that he can read it would say something. So he's bright. He's a person of authority and status. And he's also referred to as a eunuch, which I didn't really want to talk about that much. This is probably one of those moments where Pastor Van was like, I didn't tell him to go there, you know. But I think it's actually significant. Now, I'm not going to get into castration because that's really uncomfortable for me to talk about, but the implications of being a eunuch actually has some helpfulness to us in our story. And so why would Luke mention this? And he doesn't even, like, mention it. He even, like, refers to the guy as the eunuch. And so he's not even given a name. He's just called the eunuch. And the eunuchs in first century, so in, like, Gentile cultures, so non-Jewish cultures, actually oftentimes would be in places of authority and status like our friend here would actually be seen and put and preferred in for court official positions. Now, compare that to people in the Jewish community where there was, there was like instructions, no, please do not castrate our youth. Do not do this. And in fact, if this happens, you are relegated to the outer courts of worship. And so he's caught in between these two different cultures, right? This reality of this place where he lives, where actually this, like, status actually is a thing of status for him. But then he goes and he travels these long distances to go worship, and actually it's a place of, like, oh, yeah, I'm different. And so what I think what we're supposed to do here, again, is, like, we're supposed to see this person and say, this is a far ends of the earth person compared to Philip and our Jewish readers. Their, their worlds are very different. Culturally, socioeconomically, probably politically, in different places. And so we're posed with this question, if we're reading the story of Acts, we're posed with this question of like, uh, is the story of Jesus just good news for the Jewish people? Or is it really good news for the ends of the earth? And if so, how? How do we share this good news to people that are far ends of the earth kind of people? And this is where I want us to make our first observation. How do we reach far ends of the earth kind of people? Which is what reaching a secular world can feel like at times. It says, the spirit told Philip, go over and join the chariot. Or some other translations simply say, go to that chariot and stay near. Stay near. Now I did some deep digging for you on first century chariots. And this is what I found. They have wheels. I know. I spent hours. They have wheels. This chariot is moving. So just imagine for me how awkward that is. Philip is being told by this angel, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so he's just like, he's just not even told what to do when he gets to the chariot. He doesn't know the next step, except for just go and stay near. We just got to put ourselves in Philip's sandals for a moment. How awkward of a request this would be. And not only like just how awkward it would be to just like, jog next to a chariot, but you realize, like, this guy's in a chariot. I walk in my sandals. We are of different status. So, like, on the forefront, he knows we are not in similar categories here. And he's moving, and he's on his way somewhere else, so this guy probably doesn't even want to talk to me, right? So I, 
angel of the Lord, like, I'm going to just awkwardly stand next to this guy who I've got nothing in common with and just jog next to it. And, I mean, am I going to do this for hours? And then what happens? He gets there, and he hears this guy reading the scroll of Isaiah. And maybe Philip is excited, but also maybe he feels intimidated. This guy's reading the scroll out loud. This guy's bright, smart. What do I have to offer this guy? Maybe even notices his accent is way different. His skin tone is different. I don't know. This is highly uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to just stay near. But I think this is the encouragement for us, even in 21st century, an increasingly secular world, an invitation for us to stay near. And I think this actually runs sometimes counterintuitive to how we think about missions. I think often, you know, the church will sometimes use phrases like attractional. How do we get people in the church? We just got to get them to church or to camp or to our home to hear this speaker or this band. And we're rarely taught what does it look like for us to go and stay near them in their setting. Instead of going to someone else's house, often we just try to get them to our house. The place where we're comfortable. And I'm, I'm not here to critique hospitality. We should be hospitable. We, the gospel is attractive. We should think about those things. But I'm just inviting us to think through the primary way in which we think about making disciples and missions. I think we need to have a mindset shift. Our world is seeing Christianity as less and less necessary and even more like hostile towards a secular worldview. And so the the reality that someone is going to walk into our doors, the likelihood is just growing slimmer and slimmer. Secular culture can feel often like an ends of the earth kind of culture. Working on a secular campus in the Northwest, We're learning a lot about what it looks like to be missional in an increasingly secular world. Um, John Rayborn, who I work with, Maya's over here, John's over here, Um, awesome people. Like I said, it matters so much more who you go with than where you go, and so we're super grateful for them. John and I were like lamenting over like, man, we're having like the hardest time getting guys to like stick in our community. I, we text them all the time. They never want to come with us. They never want to come to Chi Alpha. They never want to come to our small group. I will buy them coffee, and they still don't want to come hang out. And we're just getting frustrated. And John had these two guys in particular. He'd just been like, man, the dude was faithful and trying to, like, invite him to things, reach out to him, try to get him to come over, try to get him in Chi Alpha. And these guys, like, every once in a while they hang out, but most time they just... The term that we use now is people ghost you, and they don't respond back. And so they just be like ghosting John all the time. At one point, John learned that these guys, one of them loved basketball, and the other one loved badminton. And now John is athletic. Like, John played football. John will run through a brick wall. But John will also tell you that he's terrible at badminton and terrible at basketball. But he learned that these two guys love basketball and badminton. And so John decided, like, you know what? Instead of trying to get them to come, study the Bible with me, have coffee with me, have some spiritual conversations, they hang out in the rec center all the time. I'm just going to go there. And John had never spent any time in the rec center. And for us as a non-student to go to the rec center, we also have to pay money. But John, being the good missionary he was, he was like, you know what? I'm going to go spend some money. I'm going to go figure out what this place is like. I'm going to go play two sports that I'm terrible at. And I'm going to go hang out with these guys. And what John found was all of a sudden, instead of John reaching out to these guys to come hang out with him, they were texting him, hey, John, do you want to come play badminton with me? Do you want to come play basketball? 
And not only did they like hanging out with John, but John realized, I'm actually having more spiritual conversations with these guys. Hitting, you know, what is it called, a birdie? What is it called? Birdie, yeah. Hitting a birdie and getting dunked on than I ever did when we would open up our Bibles and sit across the table. It took me going into their turf, staying near to them in the places that they were comfortable with for John to begin to have relationship with these guys, to begin to have spiritual conversations with them. It was John staying near that changed the game. And so as Western culture grows more and more skeptical of the church, what does it look like for us to instead say, hey, come here to me? I said, you know what, we're going to go to you. Instead of our neighbors, classmates, and family members coming to us, what does it look like for us to go to them? It's on us to be the ones to build the trust in our community. Instead of more events inside of church doors, we need the church to participate in our city, our neighborhoods, our apartment complexes, and our own families. I love it when Pastor Van commissions us at the end of our Sunday mornings and says, where you're going is going to be no accident. We call this the service, but the service of the body of Christ begins now. How much more true is that in our increasingly secular world? How much more true is it for us to like, man, let's come, gather, be built up, but now we got to go and do mission and be the church 24-7, 365. What a good word for us. What a good reminder each week for us to live that way when we leave these doors. And it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward. I am not getting any closer to the age of a freshman It's weird and awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable. But Jesus didn't invite us to the comfortable life that's truly comfortable. He invited us to lay down our lives for the sake of others. To be uncomfortable. He says that those who lose their life will find it. And so how do we make disciples in an increasingly secular world? We need to stay near the chariot. We need to stay near the chariot. And this leads to the second observation. When we're awkwardly jockeying next to the chariot, getting dunked on on the basketball court, what do we do? What does Philip do? He walks next to the chariot, and it says, he heard the man, and he asked, Do you understand what you're reading? Now, Philip knows about Jesus. He knows that Jesus is like the greatest news to ever happen. This guy, Jesus has transformed history. And here the guy is reading the scroll of Isaiah. You know, Philip could have been like, oh, dang, let's go. Like, let me tell you all you need to know to have eternal life. Here's the six six steps you got to do. Let me tell you what you got to know. But that's not where Philip begins. He doesn't begin by telling the Ethiopian everything he needs to know. He heard him, and he asked a question. What an amazing posture of humility. This is is good stuff. This is timely for us. We can argue all we want whether the stereotype is true, but the stereotype of Christians in our world is not that we are good listeners and we ask good questions. It's often quite the opposite. It's often that we're hypocritical. It's often that we speak over others or that we're tone deaf. It's that we ignore real problems and we can't see what's happening in front of us. And again, I'm not here to argue whether or not that's true, but that's the increasing view towards Jesus' people. So just imagine the kind of healing that could come when we ask a good question. Just imagine 
how might the narrative would change if we asked this question? This week, my oldest, who's four years old, and I don't remember what she did, but I think she hit her brother, and she's great and amazing. But we all, we've all had our hit their brother moments, right? So she hit her brother, and I was, like, getting frustrated because we've been talking about this. Like, we, I'm trying to help her. Like, hey, you know, you got to use your words, not your body. And uh, so I'm frustrated. I'm, like, ready to tell her everything she needs to know about not hitting. So I'm, Chloe, I know you're frustrated, but you can't hit your brother. And as I kept telling her this, I realized that she's actually getting more and more frustrated with me. And I'm getting frustrated because I'm like, you're not, like, getting it. I'm telling you what you need to know. Like, this is the solution. Don't hit him. Please. And eventually, she, like, bursts up. And in her, like, wise four-year-old moment, she says, Dad, you're not listening to me. And I wanted at first to be like, girl, you're not listening to me. Let me tell you what you need to know. And I froze for a moment. And praise the Lord, he has a lot of grace on me, because I don't always respond this well. But I froze for a moment. And even though I knew 100% I was right, I'm definitely right. It was more important for her to know that I heard her. And so I stopped and I said, Chloe, I am so sorry. You're right. What did you want to tell me? And I was surprised. That question, the combative, like, you could see the tenseness in her body building up. The question of, like, you're right, I'm sorry, what did you want to say? Just changed. Her posture and emotions Changed. And as I was preparing this week and thinking about this, I, re I realized, like, I didn't win her over by truth. I, instead, I realized that she was disarmed when I put down my arms. It wasn't my statement, it was my question. Her being heard, that was the source of reconciliation that built the bridge back between her and me. Chloe, what did you want to say? And I still told her later, you gotta not hit your brother. But that's not the game changer. That's not what shifted our relationship in that moment. I love thinking about apologetics and thinking about sound reasoning and having those kinds of conversations and arguments about why Jesus is truly, like factually, the greatest thing to ever happen and why our world needs him. But, man, our, the healing is going to happen when we ask good questions. I just don't know if that's the way we're going to win over our culture. We've been arguing those things for a long time. And you saw the trend. We're not winning souls by our sound arguments. The way we're going to reconcile with our culture is because we asked questions, because we heard the cries of our neighbors, and we were the first ones to take the posture of humility. And now, I'm taking some liberty in reading this story. Like, this story doesn't say this, but this is my own personal musing. Like, I'm not convinced this Ethiopian guy is open to Jesus because Philip just explained what was happening in the scroll. Like, he answered all of his questions. I don't think that was the primary game changer for him. If you imagine with me, you're this, you're this Ethiopian guy, you're knowledgeable in a position of influence and authority, and you have this passion to follow God, you find him intriguing and desirable, so you travel miles across the desert, only to realize you're relegated to the outer courts of worship. Because you're a foreigner, a eunuch. And so you get there, and you're like, the whole time you're there, you're frustrated, you're well aware of you're an opposite ends of the earth kind of person. Why did I come all the way here for this? And then you're on your journey home, your experience wasn't the thing that you hoped it would be, and you, so you go and you're like, hey, I, I'm actually privileged to have this scroll, I'm going to read it and study it, and maybe there'll be some answers in here for me, 
and maybe they'll create some peace in my life and help like ease some of the frustrations that I have. And you get to the scroll and you're reading it and you only find more frustration. And this unlikely person This person is not from your community, not from your background at all. This unlikely person shows up next to you, asks you a gentle question. Hey, do you understand? He hears you out. They have a conversation. He's willing to come into your chariot. I doubt Philip's ever been in a chariot before. He's willing to come into your space, have a conversation with you, Hear your questions. Hear your frustrations. We just li- we live in a time where everyone is yelling and no one is listening. I think, man, I think we, I mean, even us, but I think we're all yearning to be heard and seen. I just think about even in the last couple of weeks, Something like Roe v. Wade getting overturned. Are we listening to the cries of our culture? Are we spending more time arguing, trying to argue facts about whether this is good or wrong? Or are we stopping to just at least listen and hear the frustrations of our neighbors? Of our family members? For some of us younger, are we listening to the older generation? That often feels left out and forgotten. Are we seeking wisdom for those that have lived lives longer than us? Are we listening? I love that the first name that someone gives God in the Old Testament is they say that you are the God who sees. You could easily say you're the God who heard, who listened. To ask questions, to see and hear others That is really good news in a shouting world. Well, I'm a Christian setter. What if we became known, not by what we know, but by the questions we ask? We're invited to stay near to ask questions. Worship team, you can start making your way up here. I don't want to close by talking about Jesus. It's a good way to end any time. He's the greatest example of this kind of mission. Here's what Paul, who is a pretty good missionary in his own right, writes to a letter in the church of Philippi, and he describes Jesus in this way. And notice God's intentional missional heart through the person of Jesus. He says, Jesus, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. This is what he does instead. Rather, he made himself a nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Throughout the biblical story, in spite of our human failings and flailings, God could have existed apart from us. And let us figure it out but he consistently wanted to exist with us, to bring his presence among the people. He came to Abraham and said, I'm gonna gonna use you to be a blessing in this world. He literally pinched a tent in the middle of the Israel community so that his presence could be there. And if you read about offerings and sacrifices, it's an uncomfortable experience for God to dwell among his people. And we get to the person of Jesus, who in that scripture we just read, he he equal status with God, had the comforts of living in his heavenly throne, 
but instead puts on human skin. He comes and lives among us, and not just lives among us and stays with us, but he even becomes obedient to death. The most uncomfortable thing one can do to rescue us, to be good news to all people. And Jesus loved asking questions. He asked way more questions than he made statements. This guy could have come in and just told everybody what's up. But instead, he asked questions. Over 300 questions. It's time for us to move from primarily doing an invitational kind of mission to an incarnational kind of mission. To not just invite people to us, but to go live, in a sense, put on human skin and live amongst our community. Live amongst the secular world. To stay near, to ask questions. To live among the people and culture. What what kind of places for us, Willamette Christian Center, can we go and stay near? Is it in our families, our extended families? Places in town where you could go. Are there neighbors that you can visit? And who can you ask questions of? Maybe you already have stay near people, other ends of the earth kind of people in your life. But it's just time to take on a different posture. To ask questions. To be inquisitive. To be a good listener. We're in a cultural moment where the temptation from all sides in our country is to flee into our separate silos. What what does it look like for us to not flee, but to run next to the chariot, to engage culture? I'm convinced that real healing, real mission, is going to begin when we run to the chariots. And instead of telling people what they ought to know, we learn to ask questions. We learn to hear instead of tell. And there's a lot more for us to learn in making disciples in the 21st century, but I think this is a good place to get us started. And the good news is that Jesus is going to go with us, and we get to do this together. So ushers, you guys can come forward. We're about to do communion together. The band is going to play one song, and I'll come up, um, and I'll lead us through communion.
imagine a uh, better place to wrap up our time than at communion. We serve a missional God. We're like, even this meal in of itself, like, embodies what it looks like to live incarnationally, to stay near, to ask questions and live in a life of humility. The communion table is a, it's, it's always like special for me because I just love thinking like the, the, the width and the depth of people that have participated in this. That across the world people are partaking in this. And so we attach ourselves to the global church. And then I just love thinking through when this first started, like this got started 2,000 years ago with Jesus' closest followers. The people he was going to say, go make a disciple. And so throughout 2,000 years, we also attach ourselves to the historical church. That Jesus has loved the world, making disciples throughout cultures, and has been true to that word and empowering his people to make disciples, no matter what kinds of people, what kinds of ends of the earth kinds of people we have run into. And so what a good chance for us to come here. And I'm, I'm just a forgetful person all the time. So I'm grateful when we come here, and this is just a chance to remember. Jesus living the truest life because he loved us so well. And he loves this city well. And so this is what I want us to do. I'm going to actually invite John up here to do this with me. Can we actually get... I know I got the fancy communion thing, but could I actually get two, one for me, one for John? Um, you can come off my side, John. Um, and this is what I want us to do. Like I said, like, Jesus has promised to go do this missional thing with us. He's also promised us to do it together. And even in the words, communion is like, is a communion between us and God the Father, but it's a communion between us together. This is not a me and Jesus kind of thing. This is a we and Jesus kind of thing. And so we're not going to take this cup just by ourselves. I wish we could have this long, sprawled out table where we could like all circle together and see each other's faces. But we're going to try to get something like that. And so what we're going to do is you're going to take the bread or the equivalent if you're at home, Maybe it's the cracker or the Oreo and milk. I've heard those are good combinations. You're going to take this, and we're going to say this to each other. So find a spouse, a friend. It can even be a few of you. And you're going to, like, physically turn towards each other. And we're going to take each of these things, and we're going to just say to each other, this is God's, or Jesus' blood, broken for you. Take it. Okay? So let's all... Gather our stuff together in Junction City, online. Turn to someone. It might be a stranger, but we're all God's family together. So even if the stranger, this is going to be fantastic. We're all in this together. And so, say to your neighbor, this is God's, or Jesus' blood, or my goodness, body. Thank you, John. This is why I work with John. He really helpful for me. This body, blood. Yeah. Jesus' blood, broken for you. And he took the cup. And you're gonna turn to your neighbor and you're gonna say, This is Jesus' blood. Blood poured out for you. Okay? This is Jesus' blood poured out for you. And you can give a hug or something. I like giving John hugs, so. Praise the Lord that he goes with us. And we get to do this thing together. And then we're going to sing just the chorus of this song one more time and uh, begin to close our service.
Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Oh, so good. I love that statement. It's we. And today is a we moment, in fact. Today we head to Royal Family Kids Camp. That's right, a year of preparing, yes, yeah, that's right, yes. A year of preparing and investing and training and all of it is going in, into that. So I'm gonna invite um, all of our purple people, uh, people coming to camp, would you come on up here uh, so everyone can see your faces. Mary, would you come on and join me up here? Today, uh, we are, you, Willamette is sending us out. Uh, we are, are headed up to camp today to set up, and tomorrow we are taking kids. We have 27 kids showing up tomorrow for camp. And uh, again, yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a great week. Uh, we, we also have some volunteers out in Junction City, so make sure you come up to the front as well. Uh, before we leave, we just want to pray over this team. Uh, you at Willamette, Willamette has, has invested in this camp. For those of you that haven't heard, Royal Family Kids Camp is a camp designed for kids in the foster care system, kids who've experienced abuse or neglect. Um, and we take those kids from our community, you know, in our, in our schools, in, in our parks, you know, down the street, our neighbors who have experienced these awful things and we give them one epic week of of joy really where they get to be a kid again and experience fun and and experience adults that are safe people and ultimately they get to experience the love of Jesus being poured out um, by these guys I'm just so proud of this team and I'm so excited I'm sad because I don't get to go with them um, and there's many of you that don't get to go with them but would you pray with me? Would you pray for them? Would you lift them up on our shoulders of prayer? Because I believe that this week they have great things in store for them. Mary is